So what will I be talking about? So I'll be quickly go through the background, the timeline, work through what, what is the bill and what it is, what's in it, talk about the changes to the industry, uh, talk about a couple of the um, big changes, which is the adoption of the electrical uh, equipment safety scheme and the new requirements of vegetation management. And then I'll talk a bit about what happens next. So, those of you who've been around the file um, will remember that um, issues with the interaction of the Electoral Form Act, the safety component thereof, and the uh, licensing uh, act through the Electrical uh, Workers and Contractors Act, the uh, disconnect is got rather large and it wasn't just administrative, there was some issues being raised by um, contractors and workers that the definitions weren't, um, weren't aligned and the definitions are very out of date. So in 2018, uh, Minister, the Minister Files asked a group of people, including contractors, workers, trainers, uh, someone from Power Water, someone from Utilities Commission, uh, myself, to go through a review of the safety and licensing regime in the NT. We were asked to identify whether there are any gaps, whether their interactions are uh, working as expected, and are there any improvements we could do to our framework um, based on interstate legislation. So that started in 2018 and took a took a fair while. There was a lot of work being done. And in 2019, a 130 page report was handed up. That 130 page report um, made a lot of recommendations. And what it found was that there was overlaps and a lack of clarity within the Electrical uh, Contracts and Workers Act, the Electricity Reform Act and the Power and Water Corporation Act from a technical licensing and safety perspective. So the entire framework was disconnected and, uh, and not working properly. It recommended that the safety legislation should be amended to provide for modern definitions of electrical equipment installations and improve the capture of renewable energy sources and modern battery storage systems, something that uh, notionally we weren't capturing specifically under the Electricity Reform Act. It also recommended that the responsibilities for licensing and safety needs to be set out in a manner designed for, to maximise understanding, because it wasn't very really, and that it really should be under a single regulator under a single act. And they recommended that the act we should base it be a new act in the NT on was the Queensland Electrical Safety Act. So through that was um, discussed in 2020 in Cabinet and in late 2020 approval was given to develop a new bill. And in 2021, that bill was developed and it was circulated to the key stakeholders for feedback and discussion, especially where there were being where some changes were being made, and to make sure that those changes were coherent and co uh, consistent with what was being achieved, what was being done nationally. November 2021, the draft bill was introduced into Parliament and further consultation was commenced. So what are the proposed changes to the laws? The first thing to remember is that the prime objective is to prevent injuries or death from electricity and to prevent property damage. Prevent, we have to fix that there prevent property damage uh, due to electricity. So everything we did was to those two key priorities. So 
So what are the key features of the bill? Well, the first thing it does, it consolidates electrical safety and licensing laws into one act. So it repeals the Electrical Workers and Contractors Act and repeals or amends parts of the Electricity Reform Act, because some parts of the Electricity Reform Act deal with um, economic management and things that aren't safety related. The bill creates a single act, Electrical Safety Act in its place. It replaces the Electrical Workers and Contractors Licensing Board and the Electricity Safety Regulator with an Electrical Safety Regulator. Uh, it replaces the licensing role of the old board with um, an administrative arm of the Electrical Safety Regulator. And it empowers electrical safety inspectors to ensure compliance with quality and safety, not just safety. One of the things it does do is it creates legal obligations for anyone that can, that can affect the electrical safety of others. This is very similar to what we have in the Work Health and Safety Act. It's the same concept. However, the scope of those obligations is wider than just workplaces. Because electricity is ubiquitous to everywhere in the modern world, that safety obligation is ubiquitous to everywhere in the world. It modernises the licensing and regulation of electrical workers and contractors through it expands the definition of electrical equipment and installations to explicitly include alternative generators and battery storage. They are implicitly captured through the wiring rules, but there was some argument about a disconnect because it wasn't explicitly stated. It's now explicitly stated. It creates legislative obligations upon electricity entities. And electricity entities are the you know, Power Warner, TGen, and those entities who generate or transmit electricity. Currently, they've got license obligations, and there's a big argument about whether those license obligations are truly legally enforceable. We're now creating a, le a regulatory obligation for what's called safety management and mitigation plans. We're mandating national safety standards for electrical appliances. It creates a requirement that certificates of compliance be provided to the regulator, not just to power and water. It creates an offence of stealing electricity. There is notionally an offence of stealing electricity. It's been tried in court and it's fallen over because it isn't explicit that you aren't allowed to steal electricity. Stealing electricity is things like tampering with the meter, bypassing the meter, putting an extra line in, things of that nature. That's not explicit. And the courts have thrown out cases uh, where they've tried to prove that there is theft occurring. And it puts restrictions on inspectors' power of entry to non-work sites. Currently, inspectors have the power to enter anywhere, be it residential or non-residential. They still have the power to enter residential, but it's been constricted and there are some hoops that have to be jumped through. And most of these hoops are about um, providing information, proving you have a need to go on to those sites, except, of course, in emergency circumstances. So as I said, adopt, uh, it's already adopting a national scheme. Electrical safety provides, as I said, provides the appointment of an electrical safety regulator. Last thing it does, it, as I spoke, it establishes an electrical safety board and subcommittees. That electrical safety board will have representatives from workers, uh, employers, electrical workers, the regulator will chair it. It's got um, community members, 
electricity entity representatives. So the broad sweep of uh, people who could be affected by electricity. One of its subcommittees is a disciplinary subcommittee. That subcommittee will be chaired by a lawyer and it will have members out of the board. So the board will not only be um, looking over the strategic management of electrical safety in the NT, the board will be responsible for reviewing decisions and reviewing standards directly through its disciplinary committee. So what are the impacts upon uh, workers and contractors? Well, first of all, let's be very clear. A lot of things aren't changing. Still have to be compliant with the wiring rules. Uh, you still have to issue certificates of compliance. You'll still need permission to connect to the grid network. Uh, you, the qualifications, the different classes of license remain. We're not, we're not changing that. We're not changing the classes of license. Apprentices and trainees will still need to be supervised. And you still have an obligation to notify of accidents and dangerous incidents. The clarification of that notification is a lot stronger, but it was already there and it is still there. A couple of things are changing. Two of the main things that are changing that affect uh, workers and contractors is two new enforceable requirements. One is an improvement notice, and the other is a rectification direction. So an improvement notice is a written notice issued by an inspector requiring a safety or quality issue to be fixed. This is the, the very same concept as we have in the work health and safety legislation. It would be used where you have um, Minor infringements or minor non-compliance. Uh, CAC is incorrectly filled. Your panel isn't appropriately um, labelled. Uh, you, you could be using better lockout systems or you need to review your systems of work because you, an inspector has seen that while something isn't happening today that could be dangerous, the system in place could be dangerous in other circumstances. So just like in the work health and safety area, um, it can include directions requiring uh, re remedies or, rec or minor fixes, and um, it can include recommendations uh, such as read a code if we develop a code or review or go to the Australian standard or don't then look at a, an additional standard that might be affecting your work. The rectification direction. The rectification direction is a direction given by the regulator to rectify defective work. Now, what's defective work? It's work that the regulator considers that the way the electrical work was performed was not safe from electrical risk, or the person who actually performed the electrical work was negligent or incompetent in performing the work, or the work was performed in a way that causes a person or property to not be safe from electrical risk. So these are the big ticket items. These are things you're looking at and you're going, you've right a CIC, but it's this is a very dangerous installation. It needs to be fixed as a matter of urgency. The rectification direction will be given to the contractor who did the work unless the contractor no longer exists, in which case, as we already have today, it falls back upon the installation owner or manager to fix it. So, um, that rectification can be up to five years after the work was completed. Currently, it's only six months. It's moved out to five years. That's in line also with our ability to prosecute on the matter up to five years, some matters up to five years after the event. 
We all know that sometimes you don't see or even detect the poor work was occurred for a, for a few years afterwards. Sometimes because it doesn't get looked at, sometimes because uh, they've got away with it, sometimes because the wiring they've used is not to code to, or suitable for the NT and breaks down in two years where it should be about, should be you know, 25 years or something like that. So we've gone for a five year period for those rectification directions. The, one of the things that um, the review found was that the complaints and discipline process wasn't working well. There was disconnects between lots of poor work being done and disciplinary action being taken. And the way disciplinary action was being taken was very, uh, was not modern at all. It really needed to be upgraded to what modern expectations of what disciplinary processes look like. So we've got a new complaints and disciplinary process. This process can be taken against electrical workers, electrical contractors, including a new type of electrical contractor called an in-house electrical contractor. In-house electrical contractors are large companies that are only have electrical workers working for themselves. They're not selling their, um, selling their um, services to third parties, things like mining companies, power and water. Um, some major Aboriginal housing associate that um, work out um, in the remote communities all have all can have electrical workers on their staff working for them under an in-house contractor's license. Apprentices are, will be held for disciplinary action. The scope for, for apprentices is very small. Apprentices should be under the control of a licensed contractor worker at all times. You can't be expecting apprentices to be held to the same standards of workmanship that uh, work its licensed workers and contractors have been held to. Action can also be taken against former electrical contractors. This is because, yeah, if this is if we've been seeing a history of work and interstate electrical workers who are working temporarily in the Northern Territory. Uh, someone's traveling through, they've got a six month job for a major project and they're allowed to come in as a worker and work under their license granted in another jurisdiction. That doesn't mean they don't have to comply with our legislation. There is no limitation period for disciplinary action. This is because as we know that sometimes we develop a history of lots of small non-compliance that comes to the point where we've issued five improvement notices over four years. Um, they're, not, they're not rectifying their job. So we take them to disciplinary action because one of the things disciplinary action can do is take their license away, can bar them from ever having a license ever again, finding them, um, ordering them to undergo new training or have or have their qualifications reviewed. So there are all these things that can be done. And some of these issues that we take in front of the disciplinary committee wouldn't be single, single point act, actions or issues. they would be a history of issues. So how will this work? So a complaint will be lodged with a regulator. An inspector can lodge that complaint. And there is an inquiry into ensuring that the complaint isn't frivolous. There's a whole suite of things that the regulator can review to say, well, this is, there's nothing to see here, or this is very frivolous, or this is just being nasty. There are whole things that the regulator needs to jump through. There's a full investigation. At that point, a right of reply will be given to the person again against whom the complaint was laid. If the regulator thinks the complaints have been substantiated, it gets referred to the disciplinary committee. Now remembering the disciplinary committee is a lawyer who's on the board and members of the board. So a disciplinary committee meeting is scheduled. They have to, it's called a hearing. 
It sounds all legal. Lawyers are allowed to be involved, but we don't want lawyers involved, apart from the lawyer leading the whole thing. He's there to make sure that um, fairness is provided, that the proper governance is done, and that the decisions being made are legally defendable. A court may always overturn them, but would be on the basis of something apart from that uh, we failed to undertake the full due processes. Notice the hearing is sent out. The committee must act as quickly as possible to ensure that and to ensure natural justice and a fair process. It doesn't need to be a verbal hearing. Their right of reply allows them to make written things. Um, a lot of sparkies may, or some sparkies may prefer to say, I want a verbal hearing. I'm not good at writing what's going on, but I can show you through these pictures and what I'm doing why I think I should have action taken against me. And a decision needs to be made. Uh, if it dismisses the matter, the matter is dismissed, a notice gets out, it's all done, or disciplinary action is taken. As I said, there's a wide range of disciplinary actions taken. A notice is sent to the uh, the person who gets in the complaint was laid, telling what they need to do. Um, and we, the electric, electrical safety regulator, will publish that on its website. All discipline actions will be published if they're found to be if they're found to be proven. Another large change is the adoption of the electrical equipment safety scheme. This is the electrical equipment safety scheme is a national scheme. There previously the this these electrical safety schemes are, are there to ensure that electrical equipment used in Australia that's bought by consumers and workers and such like is safe from electrical risk and meets Australian standards. There have been a wide, there have been a number of schemes around Australia in the past. Some of them have been electrically based, some of them have been consumer law based. In the NT, we had a very small portion in the Consumer Act, which talked about electrical safety for a very small range of white goods. So there's now a national electrical equipment safety scheme that's um, run from Queensland. It uh, ties in with uh, others. There are a few schemes still in place. New South Wales is the main other jurisdiction that has a scheme. Victoria's scheme is transferring to the Queensland national scheme. New Zealand is having issues but would like to move to the using the Queensland scheme, so it would be an international scheme at that point. It captures all consumer electrical equipment designed for household and personal use. Um, it doesn't capture light bulbs, small stuff like that. It captures things like charges, electrical charges, drills, uh, white goods, anything of that nature that isn't, wouldn't be considered to need a license to be installing or operating. But it will, will it does include RCDs and some of those, um, some of that electrical equipment that is used by workers and contractors in their work. So it does capture some of that as well. So how we know, it introduces the regulatory compliance mark. So some of you may have seen, or oh, I have to fix that. Some of you may have seen that little tick before. That is the regulatory compliance mark. It's mandated by Australian standard, and that Australian standard for using it then points to an Australian standard for manufacture and verification of safety of electrical equipment. And within that, there's a very, very, very long list of electrical equipment and their appropriate. Uh, standards. So it's really, it's a very complex system, drilling all the way down to the electrical safety of individual components. So this mark shows that the, the uh, equipment has been manufactured and tested to be electrical safe. This will, of course, impact sellers of secondhand equipment. Most secondhand equipment 
will not will already have the mark on it because this mark's been around for over 20 years. If the, it doesn't have a mark on it, and you'll say a lot of uh, fridges uh, repair older fridges and sell them off their own back. Um, what they can do, the le legislation will allow them to make a, a certificate of their own saying it is electrically safe. They need to make a declaration that's electrically safe if, if it doesn't have a mark on it, that mark on it. One of the other largest changes is to vegetation management. Currently, the safety of overhead infrastructure, so these power lines, is reliant on the goodwill of property owners. Power and Water, who own and manage most of the power lines in the NT, have a very large budget and for maintaining these, and a significant portion of that budget is uh, managing trees inside people's houses because the trees, like this tree here, are falling out of their property and onto uh, their infrastructure, which of course has immediate public impact. Most, almost every jurisdiction in Australia manages it differently. They have a shared responsibility, and that's what we're going towards. The electricity industry can will now be able to establish enforceable guidelines on how they manage the vegetation. They can set, they can say what sort of trees, how high, how you should be managing them, et cetera, et cetera. This will include curbside vegetation. It will be an obligation to the landowner to manage hazardous vegetation. This obviously needs to have common sense. There will need to be all sorts of discussions underway. The point of the thing is that a landowner can't refuse to take action on hazardous vegetation. Currently, the only way you can manage hazardous vegetation, if the landowner refuses, is to go to court and you have to get court warrants to do it. You have to be accompanied by the police. It's a very, very lengthy, expensive uh, process for something that is actually a public good. We're not going, there will be an argument that, and there is an argument that this will force homeowners to manage their trees themselves, and this could be dangerous. People should never be tree lopping themselves. I don't care when or how, they should always be using their professionals. This is people taking personal responsibility for a public obligation to ensure that the public is not impacted by your personal actions to the point like we saw through Marcus that people lost powers for days on end. So what's happening next? So we've got a, we've got a few more days for our feedback on the bill. So March seven, the bill should be delayed debated in late March. If the bill gets passed through the rest of 2022, uh, we'll have public consultation on the development of the regulations. It's the regulations where the rubber hits the road. A lot of the act, a lot of the bill is just combining two acts and bringing in those few pieces of new legislation. The, it's the regulations that need a tremendous update. It's the interpretation of the act into actions. So that will be a, a lengthy process. In late 2023, we hope to have the act and regulations commence probably by early November 2023. Of course, there are going to have to be transitional arrangements to allow additional time to move from old requirements to new requirements. Um, the vegetation management is a classic example. Um, some of the regulations may need to transition as well because uh, COCs, people already have them moving to a new COC process and have set up people might need a little bit of time to get used to that. There is more information available on our NT WorkSafe website. 
the electrical safety reform.